Good evening to you. It is six, actually 627, almost 628. Um, kind of had a couple of technical difficulties about three to four minutes. I'm about three to four minutes later logging on and getting prepared than I normally would have been, but I still wanted to make sure everything was as well as it could be for visual references and for audio references also. So I'm thankful to everyone who is with us now. Uh, I'm going to give us just a few minutes past 6.30 to give everyone an opportunity to log on and to be with us. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. and I pastor New Hebrew and the Missionary Baptist Church. Well, God has blessed me to be for over 14 years now. Uh, it is dark outside. I am enjoying the time, daylight saving time. Uh, my rest has been good. Uh, the most difficult part is when we spring forward and lose one hour of sleep. So I'm already dreading that. I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. I can't enjoy the good times that God has given me and uh, it's given right now. Uh, if you don't mind, when you log on, uh, if you just say good evening or hello to everyone, and we'll try to say hello back. Tonight we're going to be in uh, one book of the Bible for our Bible study uh, question and answer, and we're going to dive in and just let the Lord lead our discussion for tonight. Uh, Sister Gardner, God bless you, and uh, oh, Brother Tidwell, good to have you with us. Uh, one half of the A-team is with us, Sister Shawan Abram, Sister Abram, God bless you. To the Milam family, God bless you as well. To everyone else whose name I may miss and have not called, uh, please forgive me. Charge it to my head and not to my heart. Sometimes it's hard to catch the faces and the names and the messages. Uh, there are a bunch of moving targets, if you understand what I mean. Go ahead and give me your coffee check-in. I know some of you got your coffee on a good, cool, brisk night like tonight, a good fall night. So good evening back to Nashville. God bless you also. Uh, to the Morris family, God bless you. Looks like I think that's Sister Clark. I'm not sure, but if it is Sister Clark, hello. God bless you. If it's not Sister Clark, she's on my mind because I see someone I think might be her uh, avatar. But nonetheless, that is Sister Clark. Good to have you, Sister Clark. Uh, turn, we're going to be in the New Testament tonight. I'm going to start. Now hold on to your hats. Calm down. I'm going to start two minutes late. I know it. Clutch your pearls. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I came on a bit later than normal. I was messing around with 15, 20 different things going on. So I want to give everyone a chance to come in. I normally try to come on anywhere from five to seven minutes early just to get us, get us settled. So we just don't start so abruptly, if you know what I mean. Uh, I hope everyone has had a good work day. For those that are retired, we thank the Lord for you. You are an encouragement to me. You give me something to shoot forward and look forward to. Hopefully that my time will come and I'll have a few pennies to rub together and, you know, we'll be able to enjoy time off work. Reverend Austin, God bless you and Sister Austin also. So I had a, a good work week so far. We've made it to Wednesday. Uh, God has blessed us to make it this far. Uh, there's so much that can and does go on, so much that takes place. You look at the news and it's as if they capitalize in uh, negativity. There's so much stuff that if it's not a fire, if it's not some political uh, upheaval, if there's not some neighborhood trouble, if it doesn't rain, it pours, it seems like. But in spite of all of this, we still know one thing, that God is still in control. He still is seated on his throne uh, and his throne is high and lifted up, the Bible says. So, giving us about two minutes. Oh, it just hurts me to be two minutes past the time. If you don't mind, we're going to go ahead and get started, and we're going to have a word of prayer. And then, uh, Brother Tim's God bless you to the Tim's family. We're going to get started with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive into our study for tonight. So, if you can take a moment, uh, if you can pause for multitasking, and uh, let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we come to you, uh, we come humbly, but yet we still come boldly before your throne of grace. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you have been. We thank you for your protection, for your peace. We thank you for the strength that you give. Thank you for the wisdom. We thank you for the difficulties that we've endured only because of you. Because in those rough times, 
We see just how strong you can be. We see just how much you love us and how much you care for us. In those rough times, we find out that we don't really have many friends. There are many, Father, who are with us on the mountain, but they leave us in the valley. But Father, you have been there. You've been a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We ask you tonight, humbly, Father, that as we go through the study of your word, help us, Father, to find the right understanding. Don't let us get off track. Don't let us, Father, veer off into the wrong teaching, the wrong understanding. We don't want to leave your word, Father, with a misunderstanding of your text. So we pray that your spirit can be the real teacher. He can use me. He can open my heart. He can guide all of our hearts that your word, Father, can land on good ground. Forgive us of our sins, the things we've done knowingly and even accidentally. Cleanse us, and we pray, Lord, that we can be vessels, Father, ready for you to be you to be used by you. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. So tonight we we, we have a very uh, unique question. I'll say unique. Um, difficult question. Uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 9. The question came in over the weekend about trying to find a proper interpretation to Mark chapter 9 and verse 49. And uh, let me say this as we, uh, I guess, embark on this time of study, uh, that I, I, I appreciate your trust in me and or this church to be able to handle any Bible question that you may have. Uh, I also do want to say that I am not the end-all, be-all, know-all of all Bible knowledge. Uh, where I am confident and where I am sure, where I can be dogmatic, I will be. I'll be honest about what I do know and honest about what I don't know. I think that's just a fair exchange to begin this teaching tonight. And tonight we have a passage of scripture that's only found in the book of Luke. It's found in, uh, excuse me, Mark, excuse me, Mark chapter 9 and verse 49. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to read Mark chapter 9 verses 42 to verse 50. Now what I'll do is, Get your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 9. I'm going to read the key verse, which is verse 49. Mark 9, jump down to verse 49. Next to the last verse in the chapter. Then we'll back up to verse 42 and work our way down through the chapter. So Mark 9 and 49, for everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So that's the, the, the verse in question. We want to make sure we have a proper interpretation of it, and that way we can make a proper application of what we know. So back up to verse 42. And here's the reason why it is important to take God's word in context. Because you can just take one excerpt from God's word, separate it from the surrounding verses, the book or the chapter, you can pretty much make it mean what you want it to mean. It must be read, understood, and interpreted in context. In many ways, this is a good lesson on Bible interpretation. You must know the verse in its proper context. Um, I was speaking to someone about contextual interpretation, and, and, and they were we were kind of having a discussion about it. I said, well, think of the word fox. You had fox, which is the animal. Uh, years ago, they don't make them anymore. You used to have a Volkswagen fox, which was a two-door kind of compact car. You have, I guess it used to be a term, maybe 70s and 80s. Men would say about a beautiful woman, oh, look at that fox. Oh, that's a, that's a foxy woman. Remember the old films with Foxy Brown in them? Or you even have an actress, if I'm not mistaken, just comes to mind, Vivica A. Fox. Now, th th this may be a bit extreme, but it will serve its purpose. Well, how do you know if you're talking about the car, the animal, a slang term used in the culture, an actress, a person? Well, you have to know the conversation in context. And when you just turn to a book, a chapter, and a verse and pull it out 
and you sit in your Sunday school class and you say, well, I think it means uh, you could be right or you could be wrong. The only way, one of the main ways to know if you are correct in the meaning in, in interpreting a passage is to look at it in context. So let's back up to Jesus in Mark chapter 9 as he's just teaching in verse 42. And uh, we'll read down to the end of the chapter. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And if your hand offends you, cut it off. It is, far, it is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into that fire that, shall, uh, that never shall be quenched. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot offends you, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter, halt into life, another word for lame, than having two feet and to be cast into hell, into that fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye offends you, Pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Verse 50 in conclusion, salt is good. But if the salt have lost its saltiness, Wherewith will we season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Let me just say to you, the majority of this is pretty much plain and understandable. The ending of this, verses 49 and 50, are problematic. These are very difficult passages, verses, verse 49 and verse 50, to interpret. So as we look at these verses here, the question for tonight is, can we get a true contextual interpretation of Mark chapter 9, verses 49? And let me say, I appreciate the question. It, it does show that somebody is certainly digging into the word, studying God's word. So G Jesus is, in essence, in this section of teaching, he, he, he's training the twelve He's preparing them for when he leaves and what he in essence is doing. He's teaching under the subject of radical discipleship. Discipleship, a follower of Christ, a learner of Christ, a servant of Christ. And he's teaching us the lengths that we must go to to be a faithful servant or disciple of his. Now, in our time, we have lowered the standard culturally. In our time, okay, if you go to church and it's just a few people there, you give yourself a gold star. If you go to church and it's raining, well, you give yourself a gold star. If you participate and you start off in ministry, it's 30 people in January, and by the time you get to the summer and the fall and the winter, it's down to three people, and you're one of those three, the 10% that remain, relatively, you look around and you give yourself a gold star. You know, I have a chain with a cross on it. I have Bible scriptures on my wall. I listen to Christian television. I have a family Bible on my coffee table. These things are not inherently bad. They're good things. Uh, devotion and ministry, Bible scriptures to remind you of the Lord, they're, they're good. But in our Western mind, in our modern society, we give ourselves kudos. Like, look at this. Look at what I'm doing. The standard for discipleship is more than having a chain with a cross on it. It's more than having a family Bible open to a favorite scripture. It's more than mentioning God at the Grammys before you get an award and after an award. I want to thank God for allowing me to do such and such and so and so. I don't know. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, be a disciple, a servant, a follower of me. You must do something. Take up your cross. Deny yourselves. And then you can follow me and be my disciples. 
Well, why am I mentioning follow me, take up your cross? The cross that Jesus spoke of, it doesn't matter what it means to us. What did Jesus mean when he said it to his followers, his disciples? The cross means death. It doesn't mean dealing with in-laws. It doesn't mean dealing with bad neighbors. It doesn't mean keeping a verse on your email chain and not caring if you get fired or not. Notable things. But Jesus said the ultimate penalty for following me is not loss of a job, loss of friends, not promotion of me by way of chain with the cross, license plate with scriptures on it. The ultimate threshold for your allegiance to me is death, which is far more than coming to church when it's cloudy or all these other things we've named. So in this, we get a picture of the extremes that we're supposed to go to. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, little ones, who's little ones? Not necessarily a child. It could be a child. But one of these little ones that believe in me is referring to believers, to all Christians. Offend, meaning cause to stumble, tempt to sin. He said, if you, you being whosoever, shall entice or tempt one of my people to sin, there is a great price that you will have to pay. You will pay dearly. Verse 42, he's talking about the extreme love that Christians should have one for another. That's, that, that's the, the thrust of verse 42. As he talks about discipleship, following him, being a servant of the Lord, we should have such an extreme love that we go out of our way not to offend, not to cause or tempt or entice to do wrong, whether directly or indirectly. He said, don't cause one of my people to stumble. Uh, the, the understanding is how you treat another Christian, whether it be entice them to do wrong directly or indirectly, Jesus takes note of that. Remember in Acts chapter 9, Saul, before his name was changed to Paul, but if you say Paul, we'll understand it. Paul was on what we have now called the Damascus Road, Jesus knocked him off of his beast, blinded him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why? Because the way you treat my people is tantamount to the way you treat me. I take notice of it. Jesus, when he was teaching, gave a parable. I was hungry. You fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was out. In the cold, you brought me in. I was naked. You gave me clothes. When did we see you this way? We never saw that. When you do it to the least of these, my brethren, it's the same as if you do it to me. Jesus shows how he identifies, how he connects, how he is involved in the life of his people. So much so to the point, he says in verse 42, anyone that offends, doesn't mean if you annoy somebody or you talk about someone, but anyone that directly or indirectly pushes one of my people to sin that believe in me, he said, if I had to compare what it would be like, rather than causing one of my people to sin, to entice them directly or indirectly to do wrong, rather than do that, it would be better for you to have a necklace with a cement medallion. Verse 42. To have a millstone that were hanged about his neck and thrown into the sea. The picture there is very plain. A millstone is what the animals would pull behind them as they would walk on the threshing floor and break up the corn and the grain. Millstones many times could weigh thousands of pounds. The mule, the oxen would pull it. That shows their strength. But nonetheless, it would be better to, better to take that heavy stone object, tie it around your neck and be drowned in the sea. That would be better for you in the end than to offend one of my people, one of these 
little ones, servants, disciples that believe in me. This shows the care, the tenderness, the love, the unity that we should have one with another. And when there's a fracture, whether it be you raising your children, whether it be with siblings, whether it be with a church member, when there's a fracture, we should be, as, as he says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. We should actively try to reconcile that difference as quickly as we can, to do what we can within our means to make sure that we bridge that gap when there's a break in fellowship. Because we don't want to entice someone to sin. We don't want to entice someone to do wrong. Friends, that fact interpretation from scripture carries a multitude of applications. You know, uh, th there's an old joke. It may have been D.O. Hughley or someone. And the comedian said, you can tell when a brother get a weight set. Well, what do you mean? Boy, he get to doing weights and pumping and eating right and jogging. And he can't wait to take off his shirt. He can't wait to wear them tight shirts that show his muscles and his body and his bulging shoulders and whatever, whatever he has. And sometimes we live in a culture to where men and women, but some men as well, they want to show off their physique to the opposite sex to entice. Oh, look at me. Look at my arms. Look at my back. Look at my legs. Look at my shoulder. They kind of bend down slow and curve their arms to show you their little muscles. Be, be, be careful in enticing someone to lust after you. Because when sin, when lust is conceived, James says, it brings forth sin. And when sin gets finished with you, it brings forth death. It's like someone who's been an alcoholic for all of their life. And through the grace of God and all kinds of other programs, they get their life clean. They don't touch alcohol. They, they barely drink caffeine. Just because it's New Year's Eve, you're not going to come popping some champagne bottle in their face. No, we don't want uncle so-and-so. We don't want aunt so-and-so. We don't want so-and-so to look at this nice little small, small cup of beverage for this wedding celebration, for New Year's. We don't want them to be enticed to going back down that road. The same way we wouldn't want to entice anyone to do something wrong in sin. It has a ton of applications. But he's talking about the love that we should have for another brother or sister in Christ. It applies to preaching. Rodney, make sure you study. Make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's. Make sure you know it's Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Verse, make sure you know it in context because you don't want to preach and to teach and even accidentally lead someone astray. You don't want to preach and to teach and even accidentally say the wrong thing where somebody could leave with the wrong understanding of what God's word says. You don't want that. So make sure you study to show yourself approved unto God because you don't want to offend one of these and mistakenly get them off the mark. That's a far cry from the selfish ambition that oftentimes we see from quote unquote ministers. Look at me, come see me, come hear me and splatter their picture on every CD, every picture on, on, on the van, in the church. And I got this, I got that. Slow down because if you draw this crowd to see you, first of all, you should be drawing the crowd to see Christ. Second of all, if you get these people in front of you and you teach them the wrong thing, you'll pay dearly for it. So verse 42, just extreme discipleship, a part of being a disciple is having sacrificial love. Now, then it, it kind of jumps down. We have to jump to a few verses. Uh, verses 43, verses 45, and verses 47. And now he goes from extreme love to talking about extreme purity or extreme holiness. In verse, verse 43, he talks about a hand. Verse 45, he talks about a foot. In verse 47, he talks about an eye. In verses 43 and 45, he said, if your hand or your foot offends you, cut it off. In verse 47, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Well, what does he mean, hand, 
foot and eye. What you do, where you go, and what you see. Now, this is personal. This is personal purity, personal holiness. To be a follower of the Lord, we are to go to the extreme lengths to protect the purity at heart. That means we watch where we go. We consider it about what we look at. We're considerate about what we do. Listen, now, keep in mind, this is not isolation. This is insulation. Well, what do I mean? This doesn't mean that you leave the city, you go way out into the woods, and all you eat is locusts and wild honey like John the Baptist, no television, don't go to the movies, don't look at the internet, don't have a computer, don't listen to the radio. No, 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 no. No, we're not talking about that. Holiness to some belief systems, no makeup, no perm, long dresses. Uh, uh, you, you've, oh, that's a holiness church. Every church should be holy. But we have taken it and put these certain factors on it culturally that equal holiness. Listen, this is not isolation. Get rid of your TV, radio, cell phone. No, it's insulation. You can have all the channels you want. That doesn't mean you have to look at everything. You can have a car. You can drive in the city wherever you want. It can be a liquor store on every corner. It can be a drug house on every corner. That doesn't mean that you have to stop and frequent these places. The point is, he's talking about extreme holiness and purity. He wants us to be pure. Only the pure at heart shall see God. Let me just say this so that we put a fence around this doctrine. This is hyperbole. This is not literally cutting off your hand, cutting off your foot. This is not literally plucking out your eye. There are some belief systems today that believe this. They put instrument under their pants and clothes, clamps around their legs to cause pain and tension and sometimes break the skin and cause blood as a way of hurting themselves to keep their mind on Jesus, to crucify the flesh in that way, literally mortify the flesh. No. In Romans 7, where Paul says, mortify the flesh, Paul is saying, kill these evil desires daily. Now, it does mean... Okay, say you went to see a movie. The, the Passion of Christ, y'all check behind me, was rated R because of the blood and the gore. But that still doesn't mean that you should frequent some of the pornographic websites. That still doesn't mean some of the late night videos, the internet stuff on the video. Be careful with what you entertain with your eyes because wandering eyes lead to wandering hearts. It is, I spoke to someone about this. Um, it used to be a time we would go into gas stations and you know, they got Ebony, they got Jet. <laughs> Remember Jet Magazine? The Beauty of the Week, Jet, Jet Magazine, all these magazines. But those kind of, we used to call them nasty magazines, dirty magazines. They'd have them way over in the corner with some kind of cover over them and, you know, nobody would walk by them because nobody wanted to go buy one and walk to the counter. I've never seen anyone to this day go to that type of place. So you had to, it was kind of culturally frowned upon. But now we have a device in our hand called a cell phone that you can type in anything you desire, anything you can think of, you can type it in and you'll see it right there in high definition, 4K, full color picture and sound. Just because you have access to it does not mean that you frequent it. This is what Jesus is talking about. And when it says, cut it off, pluck it out, it's written in the present tense. And in the Greek, when something is written in the present tense, it means continually get away from it, continually cast it away from you all of the time. Number one, it shows us the seriousness of sin. You don't just fight a fight against sin on Monday and Satan leave you alone the rest of the week. 
You don't just subdue your flesh on Sunday and then your flesh just stays at bay the rest of the week. No, no, no. Day by day by day by day. It shows the seriousness of our fight against sin and the frequency of sin rising up in us. This is not just a one time thing. I wish in the beginning of April when the pollen fell and I watered my grass, I wish I could cut it just one time and it's cut for the entire summer. Doesn't work that way. You cut it and Lord, don't let the rain come. Have to go back out there in three, four days, maybe a week, cut it again. Then you cut it and guess what? It rises again. My flower garden, flower bed in front of my house. There's weeds that pop up. Weeds will grow through concrete and rocks. And guess what? I'll pluck them out. I'll spray. And guess what will happen? A couple weeks, weeds will come back again. It continually comes back, the grass and the weed. I have to continually cut and the spray to keep them at bay. The same way with our flesh. We must continually Keep it at bay, not just on Sunday for a few hours. Continually keep it at bay, not just on Wednesday for 30, 45 minutes. Jesus said, your hand, your foot, whatever it is, if it offends you or if it's causing you to sin, remove it. It would be better for you to enter into life lamed and halt one eye, one foot, one hand, or one arm than to have all of your limbs and enter into damnation. So he's talking about as a follower of his, not only should we have an extreme love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't want to ever cause anyone to sin deliberately or accidentally. Not only should we have this extreme holiness and purity to where we're trying day by day by day by day by day to kill, to mortify, to mortify, excuse me, to subdue this flesh. We do it constantly. That weed of the flesh is always growing up. Lord, let's get the divine lawnmower and cut it down and keep it at bay. Skin it, as most folks would say in the country. Cut it down as low as it can go. The thrust of verses 45, 47, and 49, the excuse me, 43, 45, and 47, the thrust is that anything or anyone that halts, that slows down, that uh, stands in the way of you getting closer to God and your purity and your holiness, remove it. Anything or anyone. That's the context. You see how it flows on down. Well, now we get to the verses at hand. Verse 49 and verse 50. I'm kind of cherry picking these verses for time's sake so that we can arrive at the verses in question and know the flow of the text, and know the context that Jesus is having. And then he says in verse 49, for everyone that shall be salted with fire, or shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Now, admittedly, these verses, this verse, verse 49 and verse 50, they're very difficult to interpret. This phrase that Jesus is using here is only found in the book of Luke. And to the best of my studying and researching and checking, there are a couple of general interpretations that line up to it. And even those theologians, and, and from the ones that I've checked behind, they're, they're pretty extremely credible. Even they cannot be dogmatic as to which of the one or two, and I think there's even a third one that didn't seem quite plausible, but it was above my pay grade. So I said, I'm not even going to include that one. But it, it, the phrase is salted with fire. Two of the general interpretations from the sources I had, one of them is, is talking about unbelievers who have rejected Jesus. And just as salt preserves, it's the same way they will be preserved in punishment in hell forever. Salt is a 
preserver. Salt is used, was used in their time. They had no electricity. They had no LG refrigerators. There was no Frigidaire. There wasn't an ice box. They didn't have a cooler. They didn't have a Yeti. So how would they keep their meat from spoiling and going bad? They put salt on it. And salt would preserve it. And salt is a symbol of preserving in that way. And this is why when you look at the verses, it says, For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, its preserving fire, then what good is it? It's talking about one interpretation. It's talking about a body that, one of the interpretations, that is suited for everlasting punishment in hell for those that has rejected Christ. A body that retains, a body that preserves, a body that is suited for the fire that will never burn up. And you will be able to feel every ounce and bit of that pain for eternity. One interpretation. The second one, just from my, and I have to say this, my opinion, seems to fit with it a bit more than that. The first one is plausible because he's just finished talking about hell, about he talks about the hand, the eye, the foot. And he talks about in, in, in each case, if you don't cut it off, if you cut it off, because it's better to not have your hand, eye, or foot and go into eternal life than to have all of your, your limbs and to go into eternal fire or eternal damnation. And it talks about where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's a reference to Gehenna, the, the, the Valley of Hinnom. It, it became the city dump and they would take animals. They would take ho the homeless. They would take articles. They would throw them out there and that fire would continually burn over and over. The fire would never go out. It became a symbol of eternal punishment in hell. And one possible interpretation is the preservation of a body the same way salt preserves the preservation of a body that is suited for eternal punishment. Another interpretation, which I tend to lean more towards, is talking about, uh, you can uh, have it written here. I want to make sure I got my words correctly. It's talking about salt that was used for sacrifices. In Ezra chapter 6, Verses 9 and 10. In verse 9, it lists salt as one of the ingredients that was used for their sacrifices. Another Old Testament passage in Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 23 and 24. It's another reference of salt that is used with sacrifices. Salt was added to their sacrifices mainly the grain offering and the offerings of plant life, not so much with animals. But salt was added to their sacrifices because salt symbolizes preserving. But salt was added to their grain offering. Leviticus 2 is another uh, indication. Salt was added as a, uh, to their sacrifices as a symbol of God's preserving co covenant, as a symbol of God's enduring covenant covenant as a symbol of God preserving, maintaining, and keeping his word as a God being faithful to us. And in turn, when you look at verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its preservation power, its saltiness, where when, wherewith will you season it? What good is it? What seasoning will you have? And then it says at the end of verse 50, have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. You see how this verse can be very difficult to interpret and to understand. So the second interpretation has more to do with radical or extreme sacrifice. Uh, when it speaks of salt added to an offering when, and then how that relates to us, it speaks of total devotion to God. 
It speaks of total consecration to God. It speaks of a total sacrifice to the Lord. It speaks of us in Romans chapter 12, verse one. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your whole life, everything about you as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship, which is your reasonable service. And here it speaks more one of the possible two interpretations. Let me say it speaks to not just the extreme love we have for another Christian. We don't want them to fall, not just extreme purity and holiness. We want to keep our flesh at bay to the point to where we take drastic measures to prevent us from enticing and ourselves going into sin. This is extreme sacrifice to where the same way they would put salt on the offerings that they would sacrifice to the Lord that speaks of God's faithfulness to us. The same way have salt in yourself. We should make sure proof positive, make sure we do the best that we can, that we are extremely faithful, devoted, obedient, that we are faithfully following God. We faithfully sacrifice even of ourselves for the God that we love so much. Now, people, this is just a verse, a passage that's just not cute and witty and sexy and, 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 and fun and cute. This is just a passage that requires us to do the nuts and bolts of studying. Uh, once again, the verses that you can turn to of possible verses to help you with salt being added to sacrifices as a symbol of God's preserving covenant, God's faithful, enduring covenant, God's faithfulness to keep his word. Ezekiel chapter six. Verses 9 and 10, uh, excuse me, Ezra chapter 6, excuse me, don't want to lead someone the wrong way, Ezra 6, verses 9 and 10, as well as Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 23 and 24, and I'm going to make sure I get this verse in Leviticus, I think it's Leviticus 2 and 15, I had to pull it up just uh, no, I know it's in Leviticus chapter two, but we'll strike that from the record. Ezra and Ezekiel do suffice. So as I said earlier, this particular question, it is certainly a difficult one. The first section that we discussed from Mark nine verses 42 down to 47, 48, I could be dogmatic about that. This last section, every resource I was able to find and to secure, each one of them came with a disclaimer. I can't be dogmatic about this. The only place this is found is in the book of Mark. There's not many other references. So this is a part of scripture to where God sovereignly has just chosen not to be as clear as we would like. This passage is just not as clear as John 3 and 16. So uh, when we get to heaven, <laughs> we're going to sit around the throne and we'll find out exactly what he meant. Were we close? Were we far off? Was it something that we missed completely? But I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I must be honest. I have to be honest about what I'm dogmatic about and what I'm sure. I also have to be honest about where I'm not as clear and the information that I receive is just not as crystal clear either. Friends, let me say this to you. Welcome to Bible study. These are the challenges that sometimes we just find ourselves in. So hopefully at least the whole picture could be painted. The general theme, direction, and thrust could be laid out. And hopefully there can be some information in here that, if nothing else, can be beneficial to us in our daily walk. I believe all of us can benefit from being a bit more devoted to the Lord in any area, really every area. So I certainly appreciate your time for tonight. I hope all of you have enjoyed this time with us. We appreciate your support, if nothing else, with your presence. 
Make sure that you get your rest because Lord willing, Sunday morning we'll crank up again and we'll get started with our Sunday school lesson at 930, shortly thereafter followed by our morning message at 1045. We're currently going through a sermon series entitled The Hard Realities of Serving the Lord. Yes, there are just some awkwardness, some difficulties that just come with the package, but there's no sacrifice that we can make for the Lord that is not worth it in the end. So hopefully it's been a blessing to many people. Lord knows it's been a benefit and a blessing to me. So if nobody else has been blessed, I can say, Lord, thank you. You've been blessing me with some of these messages and lessons that we go through in the word. So Leviticus 2 and 13. Thank you, Sister Bertie Davis. I think I said 15. So I didn't want to keep going verse to verse. So Leviticus 2 and 13, another reference to salt. So Sister Bertie Davis, thank you for that. I appreciate you. So to all of you, I pray that you enjoy the rest of your evening. Please feel free, if you do have a Bible question, you can go to the church's website, newhebronlr.org, and it's pretty easy to uh, navigate. I think there's even a tab that may say Bible question, but nonetheless, you can be able to go to a resources tab, and you'll be able to find the information that you need. I pray that everyone stays safe. Enjoy your night, and I hope to see you soon, if nothing else, on Sunday morning. So God bless you and God keep you until we meet again.